like you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Amos, chapter 8. This is a passage I often quote in our daily program, and I believe it's very apt for the day in which we're living. The book of Amos, chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. And you can go almost coast to coast in Canada, and the United States, and the world and hardly find the word of God. Amos here, 2,500 years ago, prophesied of a very serious time in history before the coming of the Lord when there would be a famine all over the land. A terrible famine. A famine that would come because there's no Bible available. No Bible. A famine of the hearing of the words of the Lord. If we have no Bible, we have no salvation. If we have no Bible, we have no faith. If we have no Bible, we have no Holy Spirit. If we have no Bible, we have no hope. And if we have no Bible, we have no heaven. There's no source of truth outside of the Bible. It's the foundation. It's the source of life and the source of truth. But we have Bibles every Sunday. Thousands of preachers preach to thousands of people from the Bible all over the land wherever you go people are gathered together to hear the word of the Lord to hear the preacher preach from the Bible and to hear a message from the word of God The question is, which Bible? Every Bible, except this one, has over 5,000 changes, deletions, additions, or something else. Is that the Bible? So the question is, do we have a Bible today? Do we have a Bible? There are over a hundred versions and translations of the Bible in existence today, and they're coming on stream all the time. Are all the Word of God, every one of them? Are they all the Bible? Are they the Word of God? Well, if they're not all the Word of God, which one is the Word of God? Let's ask some of the scholars. Bob Jones University, I quote, There is no perfect English translation. They're in bad shape. San Francisco Baptist Theological Seminary. Versions and translations are not inspired, only the original. They're in bad shape. Fuller Theological Seminary. I do not believe that the various translations are inerrant so quickly we're going to leave the colleges the scholars will lead us astray let's go to that local preacher maybe the one that preaches to you every Sunday let's ask him a question sir do we have a Bible today Do you hold in your hand the word of God? And here's what he'll say. 
at least 95 to 96 percent of them, here's what they'll say. I quote, the Bible is the Word of God. It is perfect, pure, infallible in the original text. We have many fine versions. Some are close to the originals. Of course, no translation is perfect. But you may rest assured that God's message has been preserved down through the ages. Now that's what all the preachers tell me that I talk to. All the Christians tell me that. That's what their preachers say. And I want to examine that statement. That's what they believe today. First of all, they say the Bible is the Word of God. Which one do they mean? They mean the Bible in the original. So what they really mean is the Bible was the Word of God. That's what they mean. Not the Bible is the Word of God because they don't have it. They don't have the originals. Nobody does. I'm glad we don't. I couldn't read them anyway. What they're saying is the Bible was the Word of God. They don't want to come right out and say that. Yes, the Bible is the Word of God, they tell you, but they don't mean it. Secondly, it is perfect, pure, and inerrant, and infallible in the original manuscripts. Where are they? And if we did have them, who could read them? I couldn't read them. Three, we have many fine versions. What's fine? What do they mean? We have many fine versions. How can there be fine versions if they contradict each other? Every one contradicts the other. There are over 70,000 changes if you take all the versions, combine them together. Or some of these versions are very close to the originals. What do they mean by close? If the pitcher is pitching a baseball, he may want to come close to the batter. But I don't know what they mean when they say, some of these versions are very close to the originals. How do they know how close the Bible is if they don't have the originals? How can they compare? Here are the originals over here, blank. Here's the Bible over here, so we're going to compare it with that. There's nothing there to compare it with. How can it be a fine version? And if you compare, we had one comparison already, Acts 8.37. And if you start comparing the Bible with the King James Version Bible, you'll find some very serious doctrinal errors. Acts 8.37. When you leave out Acts 8.37, you have baptismal regeneration. It's not just enough to get saved. But the next question is, if you believe with all your heart, thou mayest be baptized. That's the issue. And when you leave that out, then you have baptismal regeneration. And of course, there's a lot of baptismal regeneration on the go today, not only in the Roman Catholic Church. Baptism is a vital doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. But it's also a vital doctrine of the Church of Christ, of the Lutheran Church, of the Presbyterian Church, of the Methodist Church and of many other churches. A vital doctrine. But we do not believe in baptismal regeneration. We believe in believer's baptism by immersion as a testimony to the world that we've been dead, buried, and risen with Christ and that we're going to walk in newness of life 
and it's a visible illustration, manifestation, a working before the world as a testimony where we stand with the Lord. Now, they tell us that no translation is perfect. I just read that. Bob Jones University. Most all of these uh, colleges. Most all of the radio broadcasts. I mean most all. I'm talking about 95%. 95%. I'm talking about McGee. Oh yes, McGee. He really specializes in the King James. But he says there's some other good ones. And the moment you say there's even one more good one, you don't really believe in the King James. Amen. Can't be both. Amen. Can't be both. Back to Bible Hour. Radio Bible class now has gone into the new King James. And they'll send you a three-page letter if you write them and ask them why. And they have real good scholarship reasons. No, they say there's no perfect Bible. And therefore, if there's no perfect Bible, God did not preserve his word. So who are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the scholars? And you know, friends, scholarship is all right in its, in its place but it's very deadly for spiritual life today. There was a time when even Bible schools could give you a lot of help, but I'll tell you, most of them can't anymore. They can't anymore. Well, rather than scholarships, I'm going to now listen to the Word of God. I want you to listen to it. 1 Peter 1.25 God's word endureth forever. Now, it's very strange to me that you'll listen to the preacher either in your pulpit, in your church, or over the air, radio or television, and you'll go along with him. And what he talks, just what I've mentioned a while ago, this is what they're saying today. There's no perfect Bible. But God says, God's word endureth forever. So, I'm going to believe God. Luke 21, 33, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, no famine, no famine, my words shall not pass away. Here they are. The words of the Lord. Amos said there's going to come a day when there will be a great famine in the land, not a famine of bread or of water, but a famine of the hearing of the words of the Lord. And that famine is upon us, but there's no famine for believers. Amen. No famine for believers. Psalm 12. I think I'll just look at that psalm. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of fire, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them forever from this generation. How many believe God? Let me turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. 19. And being not weak in faith, he, Abraham, considered not his own body, now dead. Now an old man. When he was about a hundred years old, now God said, Abraham... I'm going to give you a son, a child, an heir, and in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And he's now a hundred years old. God promised him a child. 
Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. An impossibility, the world would say. God will not fulfill his promise. God can't work this miracle. We cannot believe in that kind of a fulfillment of promise. Verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Yet people are staggering today at the promise of God concerning his word. But was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Now friends, we have the same God and the same Bible and the same promises of the Lord that he would preserve his word and that he would keep his words, heaven and earth would pass away, but his words will not pass away. And by faith, we believe God rather than the scholars. And 95 or 96 percent, and it could be 98 percent, of all preachers are going the way of the scholars and the colleges and the Bible schools and the faith missions and the broadcasts and the television programs and the magazines and the evangelists and the organizations and the so-called Christian witness and organizations of our day. Psalm 119, 152, concerning thy testimony, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Forever! The testimonies of God. God has preserved his word. Psalm 119, verse 160, thy word is true from the beginning and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Forever. So, if you're going to believe God, then you can't believe your preacher. You can't go both ways. You can't go both ways. Now I'll tell you, friends, I say it, I will not I will not listen to any preacher that doesn't use the King James Version. I will not fellowship with any preacher that does not use the King James Version. And I'll make that very clear in my message on Bible separation. I will not support any preacher or any work of the Lord or any broadcast, or any television show, or any faith missions, or any Bible school that uses versions. Even one little bit, even just the beginning. We watched it in Prairie Bible Institute. First they just shove in one little verse in the whole magazine. Then a few and now they're using more and more. See, they more or less brainwash the Christians. And you mustn't say a word. But you know, Dr. Woodbridge used to point out a wonderful passage in Acts chapter 20. Paul there, when he gathered the elders of Ephesus together, he told them two things. He told them, first of all, that they were there to feed the Christians. To feed the Christians. And then, secondly, they were there, he was there to warn the Christians. Feed the Christians. Verse 28, 
Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. And he says, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you not sparing the flock. They're going to come right in from amongst them. That's how, that's how the preachers get in amongst us today. They come from Bob Jones. They come from the different theological schools, not Bible schools, and they've been brainwashed, and then they come in the pulpit, and they're going to start brainwashing you. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. See, everybody believes that the preacher should feed the people. And many of us are getting very fat. But when we come to warn, we don't hear so many amens. People don't like a warning ministry. This conference is a warning ministry as well as a feeding ministry. We have Bible studies every day. It's well prepared. It's well organized. But we also have warning. And we need the warning today because... The wolves are here in sheep's clothing. That's the thing. They look like sheep. They talk like sheep. Ah! Wherever they go. But they're wolves. And if you're not warned, they're going to take away your faith. And they're taking away faith in the Word of God today. There's a famine all over this land. I don't. I don't. In all of Canada, if you'd find 10 or 15 churches where the preacher stands only on the King James, I didn't say preach in the King James. Bob Jones preaches in the King James, but they don't believe. They don't believe it. Bob Jones, everybody knows, there are only two sources of text. One, two. Over here, West Cotton Hort. Over here, Texas Receptus. Bob Jones says this is the best text. Most accurate, most scholarly, the very best. And from this text comes the Roman Catholic Bible, the Jehovah's Witness Bible, the New American Standard, that is their Bible, and a hundred other versions and translations. From this inferior text comes the King James. So in the pulpit, they take the inferior text Bible and read it. And in the classroom, they take the superior text, the scholarly text, the more accurate text, upon which the New American Standard Version is based, and they teach the preacher boys, that's the best word of God. That's deception. Amen. That's deception. And you don't have to be a scholar to understand the deception. You see. And I want to tell you this, it's very sad that even these great schools that have accomplished so much and had such a foundation and a good beginning that you dare not say a word today and you mustn't say a word because they say you're reflecting on the finest schools of the country. There's no reflection whatever. It's just a fact. It's just exactly what they believe today and it's what they're following. Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come, the latter times, forever and ever. God wants his book, his word, written, put down, forever and ever. Now the question is, did Jesus believe God? Most preachers don't. 
Most Christians don't. Did Jesus believe God? Matthew 5, 18. Till heaven and earth pass on, pass away, one, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. Jesus believed what God said in the Old Testament concerning the preservation of his word. And there wouldn't be a jot or a tittle ever passed from the word of God. John 10, 35, the scriptures cannot be broken. I want you to notice that. These different schools that I've mentioned, they say, and I quote again, there is no perfect English translation. Bob Jones, Lancaster Bible College. There is no perfect and infallible English translation today. Now Jesus said the scriptures are word perfect. They cannot be broken. Word perfect. So, you have to decide who you're going to believe. Dean Bergen, one of the great scholars, has given us so much information about the Word of God. He says there exists no reason for supposing that the divine agent, the Holy Spirit, who in the first instance thus gave to mankind the scriptures of truth, straightway abdicated his office, took no further care of his work, abandoned those precious writings to their fate. All down the ages, the sacred writings must needs have been God's peculiar care, that the church under God has watched over them with intelligence and skill, has recognized which copies exhibit a fabricated which an honestly transcribed text has generally sanctioned the one and generally disallowed the other. And I believe that's what the work of the church is today, to distinguish between what's truth and error, what is the word of God and what's not the word of God. And as he says, why would the Holy Spirit, if he's behind the word of God, advocate the work that he accomplished at the very beginning and bring out all of these translations and versions with over 70,000 changes, deletions and additions and all that goes with it. God has promised that his word would have certain characteristics whereby we may know what's the word of God. And this is the basis of our judgment for all other Bibles. Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. If it's pure, there are no additions and changes and deletions and all that goes with it. And no denial of the Son of God, no changing of important doctrinal things. It's pure. Proverbs 8, verse 8. They are not forward or not perverse. All the versions are perverse. The word of God is not perverse. 1 John 2, 21. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. No lie is of the truth. Brother Starr gave us something of the New King James Version. I'll give you one or two passages. Radio Bible Class says this is the most scholarly today. 2 Corinthians 2.17. I'm giving you one Brother Starr didn't mention. For King James, the Bible, the Word of God, we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Now comes the New King James. For we are not as many peddling the word of God. As Brother Starr pointed out, you read the whole introduction to the New King James Version. They say it comes from the authorized text. They say all they're doing is making some outward changes 
But the strange thing is that when they make the changes, they use the text of Westcott and Hort. Even though they deny in the introduction that they're using Westcott and Hort. That's not honest. I like a man to come out and say, I don't believe in any other text but the West Cotton Hort. And I believe in all these versions. That's what I like you to hear. We had a man come to Halifax, graduated from New Brunswick Bible Institute. And uh, he said, I'm going to introduce in this church, this he said the first Sunday, I'm going to introduce in this church the new international version. And in three months, I'm going to brainwash every one of you. I like that. That's honest. That's honest. The other's not honest. Did you hear the difference here? We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God and the New King James. We are not as many peddling the Word of God. Now, there's a difference between corrupting and peddling. You may peddle something that's corrupt. But the Word of God, what they were doing... We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. They were corrupting the Word of God. Today we have the corruption of the Word of God and we have the peddling of the corruption. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. King James, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by in stores God hath prospered him. New King James, on the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up, as he may prosper. Who's going to do the prospering? Man or God? Luke 4, 7. God says, our the true Bible, if thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. King, New King James. Therefore, if you will worship before me, big difference. Big difference between worshiping me and worshiping before me. That's corruption. That's not honest. That's not true. And I could give you many other if we had the time. We have it all over the land today. I believe this. Turn to Jeremiah. I haven't got too much time to read it. But I believe that modern translators today are not that modern. They're like Jehoiakim, who was the king of Jerusalem. And the mutilation of the scripture given in Jeremiah 36, 22, and 23. Now we remember, remember that a message from the Lord was dictated by Jeremiah to Barak, son of Neriah, who carefully wrote it in a roll. Jehoiakim came to know of this divine oracle and sent Jehudi to get it and read it to him. As Jehudi read it, whatever did not please the king, he would cut out with his pen knife and cast it into the fire. And that's exactly what they're doing today. What they don't like, what they want to change, they cut it out. That's exactly what West Cotton Hort did. He cut it out. These men didn't believe in the inspiration of the Bible. They didn't believe the deity of Christ. They believed in evolution. They are, their texts are, are found... They're grounded, based, foundational, on Roman Catholic texts. And anything that comes from Rome is not pure. You can't have both. The New American Standard Version, we want to look at that for a moment. John 6.69 King James, we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. New American Standard, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Friends, that's a very great weakening of the deity of Christ. And that's what Bob Jones stands for. They say, this is the better Bible. It comes from a better text. They can have it. Now, the New American Standard Version, John 7, 53 to 8, verse 11. It says here, a note, 
that is not found in the oldest manuscripts. And that's not true. I have a note here that says the British Museum has 73 manuscripts and 61 of them have this passage. They're not telling the truth. I don't know if you noticed in your hotel room here the Gideon Bible. The new King James Version. At least the one in our room. And you know, very strange to me about the Gideons, when I started my ministry many years ago, well over 40 years ago, I've been preaching 48, but well over 40 years ago, we used to have the Gideons in, and they would tell about placing the Bible in hotel rooms, and how this one would get saved, and that one would get saved, and what a blessing it was. And then all of a sudden, when I wrote that up in our magazine, we had a delegation of five of them from Ontario come down to see me. They said, now, we have two problems. The first problem is that people can't understand the King James Version. Well, I said, very strange. Forty years ago, they all could. <laughs> the, the Gideons used to come in and tell us of all the great blessings that the Bible, and the only Bible they ever knew was the King James Version. It's the only Bible they ever knew. Yet there were souls after souls saved. According to the testimony of your magazine and of your... Gideon men who used to go around to the different churches. Then they said the second problem is that Roman Catholics will not accept the King James Version, so we have to put in another version. Well, there's no Roman Catholics in this hotel. I mean, there may be Roman Catholics come the same as we come and just stay for a night. But this is not a Roman Catholic area, but the Gideons have put in a different kind of a Bible. And I can take you to different places uh, in Canada where there's the New American Standard, where's the New King James, all put in by the Gideons, and it has nothing to do with the Roman Catholics. And I'll tell you this. I know many Roman Catholics saved. And Brother Starr is many former Roman Catholics in his church. And I will say this that everyone I know that has been saved has been saved through the King James Version. Amen. Without exception. They can understand it. They can understand it just as well as can be. <coughs> C.H. Spurgeon withdrew from his modernistic denomination. His wife said, that the stand that he took and the opposition that he received brought about an early death. And I believe it. What did he think about the inspired word of God? Quote, We the undersigned banded together in fraternal union, observing with growing pain and sorrow the loosening hold of many upon the truths of revelation are constrained to avow our firmest belief in the verbal inspiration of all Holy Scripture as originally given. To us, the Bible does not merely contain the Word of God, but is the Word of God now. From beginning to end, we accept it, we believe it, and we continue to preach it. To us, the Old Testament is no less inspired than the New. The book is an organic whole. Reverence for the New Testament, accompanied by skepticism as to the old, appears to us absurd. The two must stand or fall together. We accept Christ's own verdict concerning Moses and the prophets in preference to any of the supposed discoveries of the so-called higher criticism. Those men took a stand that cost them something. And some of you have come to me and said, what am I going to do? I said, you're going to have to leave your church. 
I myself, they, they ask me, what will you do? I will not sit under any preacher that doesn't preach in the Word of God. And there's only one Word of God, and that's the King James Version. I will not. I will not. I will not go to any church. I will not have fellowship with any preacher. I mean fellowship. I'm not talking about having a cup of tea. I'm not talking about having lunch together. Our book room, it's almost over now. We've had a book room for 40 years. But when the preachers come in, I tried to make a point, even when I was busy, to be friendly, to be kind. We never tried to preach to them. We never tried to convert them. We never tried to change them. But I was kind. I made it a point to go and see them, talk to them, ask them how they're getting along, and even encourage them. See, no one can ever say that I do not love these preachers. I loved, I loved the Back the Bible Hour. To me, it was the greatest program on the air under Theodore F. When I saw him beginning to use versions and to speak at these wicked places like the great uh, radio council that meets every February, all the radio people all over the land, they all meet. Theodore Epp used to be the president. Roman Catholics there, the manager of WROL, Boston, a Roman Catholic, unsaved, told me when he went there last February, it would be his last time. He said, it's nothing but Roman Catholics and Charismatics. Theodore Epp didn't see that at all. Dear boy, in, in glory now. But you see, the problem, they were mentioned about Jack Wurtz, and the problem of all these broadcasts and all these ministries is a matter of support. And I want to tell you this. When I take a stand, for example, Brother Reynolds, on these issues, it doesn't mean that many Christians send in support. In fact, we almost count every week the people who stop giving and then look to the Lord to see if we can get some others just to make up of the ones that who backed out and said, we don't like your preaching, it's too negative, too narrow, and we're not going to support you anymore. Well, I say this, if we have to use versions and uphold versions to get our support, we're going out of business. We're going out of business. And that's exactly what has happened to faith missions. It's happened to the Gideons. It's happened to Billy Graham. It's happened to Jack Wurtson. It's happened to John MacArthur. It's happening to Jerry Falwell. He's now even on the charismatic group to get support. So he's really widening his wings. And it's always a temptation when the manager called Brother Reynolds, KTYM, Los Angeles, I used to be on that station, and uh, said, now look, we're getting complaints. Brother Reynolds here just said, well, really, I'm sorry. I'll never mention those things again. <laughs> See, that's probably his oldest station. And they'll probably be putting him off. But you see, he shouldn't be so dogmatic. And the whole problem today is when you are dogmatic and when you believe something and you want to present it, it's going to cost something. I've been put off, well, I've been put off Bob Jones University for stand for the Word of God. Bob Jones University radio station. I've been put off it for standing for the Word of God. <laughs> I've been put off all Pat Robertson stations. I don't think he has them now, but he had about five. And I was on them all. And I was put off for the same reason. I've been put off lots of program, lots of stations when evangelical pastors complained. And the stations put me off in Canada. Quite a few. But we're still on. I believe this, that the stand of the conference and the stand of fundamentalism is that there's only one Bible, the Word of God. 
And I want to encourage you, friends, it's not going to be easy. But I say this, when you leave that church, when you stop supporting that ministry, I believe this, that God could send in a preacher. God could raise up another testimony if you're willing to pray and believe. You're going to have to do it.